Okay, I think we're going to be able to go ahead and get started now. Um, we are going to, there is an agenda, which I think everybody had. One of the things that I really miss with our um, Zoom kind of structure is the wonderful handouts that would come with these meetings. And when you had a handout, uh, we would be able to kind of follow along and see what's in a handout. We're not able to do that um, as well through Zoom. Um, there is information can be sent or will be sent, follow up and other things. And to let you know, today, the purpose of today is an introduction to these boards, councils and organizations. However, it is not a budget presentation. So we will, I know some of that information may be in your materials, but we're not looking to go over budgets. What we wanna do is for, uh, especially new committee members uh, that are on this committee and there are uh, several of them, it gives them an opportunity to just know who are you and how this is um, and how you work and what you do, uh, introduction to the committee members. You will be coming back when it is time for the budget and then we will go into more detail on those matters then and deal with any budget issues, questions and such. But for today, it's an introduction. So we have our senators here and we have our staff and I think most of you have had an opportunity for that. And right now we're going to get started on the first person, that's always the hardest spot. And so Sue Jens, Miss Jens uh, from the Arts Board is gonna be the first to kick it off today and cover uh, an introduction and set the stage. And we've asked each of you to do three, four minutes uh, in regards to an introduction. Ms. Jens, go ahead. Uh, your mute is on maybe. Okay, Sue, if you need to do a little technical work, we'll have our staff help you. Uh, and let's go instead then while you work that out and let's go to the Gambling Control Board. Uh, Mr. Getman. Madam Chair, see you again. Senators, it's a pleasure. Staff, uh, thank you for the time. Uh, Minnesota ranks number one in the U.S. for lawful or what we call charitable gambling, reaching over $2 billion in gross sales for each of the last three years. My predator actually used to joke, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, exclusively using cash, mainly by volunteers at alcoholic establishments. What could possibly go wrong? Well, that's where we come in. We're responsible for regulating and providing the oversight. The Gambling Control Board uh, is meant to ensure the integrity of the operations and provide for the lawful use of the net profits. The lawful gambling in Minnesota includes five different types of games, bingo and pull tab, both bingo and pull tabs are also available electronically on closed systems using iPads. There are also raffles, that's the third one, and tip boards is the fourth one. And tip boards actually include sports theme tip boards. So some would say that Minnesota already has sports gambling in the state. And finally, the fifth type of gambling is paddle wheels. And that's conducted in two forms. The less common is a paddle wheel with a table and there's only about 20 sites throughout the state that use that. And more prevalent at many places around the state is a paddle wheel that's commonly used to conduct what's typically called a meat raffle. Net profits are used for Minnesota veterans and their families, fraternal groups like Eagles, Elks, and Knights Columbus, clubs like the Lions, JCs, Rod and Gun Clubs, sports clubs, snowmobile clubs, youth activities, fire and safety equipment for local communities, religious and community educational training programs, support for local governments and wildlife and natural resource programs. The Gambling Control Board itself is entirely funded by the industry it regulates. So no money is actually asked for or comes out of the general fund. All fees collected go into a dedicated lawful gambling regulatory account and license fees that are collected from the manufacturers, distributors, sales folks, linked bingo game providers, and of course the organizations themselves. Manufacturers also pay for game approval testing, those nonprofit organizations, pay a license fee, as well as a premise permit fee, along with a regulatory fee, all based on their gross sales. So the board itself, we are a small but very active board. We consist of seven volunteer citizens appointed to the board and then 32 staff employees. Those 32 staff provide regulatory oversight, education and guidance 
throughout the month. And then on a monthly basis, seven volunteer citizens meet and approve activities that have gone on throughout the month and approved for the next month as well. The board, the 32 staff are broken out into licensing, auditing, and investigations. And we're spread out in four offices across the state. We have Hibbing, Mankato, Fergus Falls offices, and then our main offices in Roseville, Minnesota. And then please let me recognize some highlights from 2020. There were two types of reviews that only came about because the board had the unique opportunity during the first COVID pause to check the integrity of two aspects of the industry that would not normally be available when games and cash continue to flow through the charitable organizations. The first one was called account verification reviews, and the second one was lawful purpose expenditures. They're self-explanatory, but I would be glad to explain in more detail at a later time to anyone interested. And these reviews led to several organizations saying, yep, you caught my hand in the cookie jar. And so the COVID pause also led the board to drive towards and ultimately obtain several executive orders to help the charitable organizations through that tumultuous time. One of them was to keep the veterans and fraternal organizations doors open. Those facilities are used for multiple purposes, not just for gambling. And we authorized or we had the executive auth um, order authorize a reverse loan of the gambling proceeds back to the parent organization who maintains that, that organizationally owned building. The second one was a star rating requirement waiver for fiscal year 20. The third one was a gambling equipment credit sales exemption. The fourth one was a license renewal date extension. So all those folks that paid fees, we actually extended those twice now, uh, 60 days. And then we also had an emergency gambling manager training requirement that we revamped our online training to stand up an online training for new gambling managers. The board also uh, increased the options for the continuing education for those incumbent gambling managers. The board has successfully defended the electronic pull tabs in two separate petitions filed with the Office of Administrative Hearings that challenged the electronic pull tabs legitimacy against slot machines. The board also ensured the regulatory compliance during those record month sales between the two pauses that were averaging $250 million in gross sales each month, even though there were limited site locations and each location had capacity restrictions. The board's customer service did not pause. We migrated to cell phones for staff, telecommuting, online services for the industry, revamped site inspections, and also held all the public board meetings virtually. The board also maintained a perfect on-time record for the reporting and oversight requirements. However, the, the last year didn't come without issues above and beyond the ones I mentioned. As I mentioned in the, in the get-go, we are an all-cash industry, which comes with its own unique problems. The charity's tax structure and other expenses were more controversial this last year, especially for those larger organizations where available funds for the charitable purposes declined while their taxes and other expenses rose. And the industry also saw a movement towards consolidation of the gambling equipment providers. And then on the regulatory side, on the board side, we continue to defend against electronic pull tab challenges from the casino industry. We've been grappling with the need for upgrading our IT resources, especially as we move more things towards the internet and the ability to backfill two of our seven uh, volunteer board members have gone vacant. And we are looking actively to replace those to maintain our active monthly board meetings. And then our staffing levels have remained unchanged despite the huge growth of the industry and its increasing complexity. So look forward to discussing the proposals with each of you as you have time, as your schedules permit, either during the session or outside of the actual open sessions, and work with you to answer any questions about our proposals and for the industry itself. Thank you for this opportunity to introduce the board and to your committee and stand ready for any questions, but otherwise we'll stand ready outside of this, knowing the briefness that we're, we're meant to provide. Thank you, Madam Chair and staff. Thank you, Mr. Getman. Well done. Uh, great example set here. Um, very informative, appreciate it very much. And uh, we do look forward to those more in details and committee members at any time, you can call on Mr. Gepman to go into further detail on the work that they do. But with that and the full agenda we have today, we'll go back again to see if Ms. Jens, uh, are you able to uh, be able to present to us? I, I see you there. Are you able to hear me now? We are able to hear you now, Ms. Jens, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bjorn, for your help. And I apologize, I'm, I'm not good at technology. So thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, I am Sue Jens, I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Arts Board, and I appreciate this opportunity to give you just a snapshot of our work. 
The Arts Board is a state agency. Uh, our structure and duties are in Minnesota Statutes 129D, and our mission in the statute is to stimulate and encourage the creation, performance, and appreciation of the arts throughout the state. So I'm representing an appointed board. The governor appoints our board members and they are approved with the consent of the Senate. And um, we have a professional staff that supports their work. We've given you a link to the board so you can learn a little bit more about who they are and, and what their backgrounds are. We do many things, but there really are three key headings under which our activities fall. First and foremost, we provide financial support for the arts. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Secondly, we're the fiscal agent for a series of 11 regional arts councils. And in the materials we gave you, you have a map of the state with the 11 councils uh, delineated. They are not extensions or satellite offices of the board. They are independent nonprofit organizations with their own local boards, and they are responsible for making decisions about how best to invest dollars in their regions. And finally, we're a resource. We're a resource to many of the other agencies that are in your committee. Uh, and to agencies outside of state government on matters related to the arts. I'd promise to return to grant making and financial assistance since that really is the majority of what we do. 92% of the dollars, general fund dollars that you appropriate to the arts board leave our office in the form of a grant. And um, the regional arts councils also use the majority of their dollars for grant making. I wanted to highlight uh, just three of the strengths of this statewide grant making system. Uh, one of them is that it's citizen driven. I'm not the one who's deciding how to invest dollars across the state. It's 11 board members from across the state. It's 160 uh, regional arts council board members, and it's hundreds of individuals who review grant applications and decide how to uh, spend those dollars. Secondly, it's a rigorous process. We have established guidelines, established procedures for reviewing applications. We report and we monitor grants. The Arts Board has rulemaking authority, so we also promulgate our Arts Board grant programs into Minnesota rules. Finally, it's a transparent and open process. We are under the open meeting law. Our meetings and review meetings are open to the public. Regional Arts Councils, when they sign their fiscal agent agreement with the Arts Board, also agree to have open meetings and to conduct their business in an open and transparent manner. So this system really was created to ensure that the dollars you invest in the Arts Board and the Regional Arts Councils reaches all 87 counties. Uh, I gave you in your handout um, some numbers, um, financial numbers, which I know we'll talk about at another time, but two numbers I'll highlight. In the last biennium, collectively, we awarded more than 4,500 grants. Obviously, I can't tell you about all of them today, but I'll give you a range of the kinds of things that are supported. It ranges from very small it might be a grant to a young person who wants to attend a summer theater or dance camp. It might be a grant to a, a group of individuals who want to start a nonprofit arts organization in their community and need help with financial or strategic planning. It might be a grant to an artist who has a, a, a ceramic studio uh, or a photography studio and they want to teach classes or expand their, their ability to provide their work to Minnesotans. Or it might be a grant to a mid-sized or even one of the largest institution, arts institutions in the state to do their education, their outreach, and make their programming available. I'm going to close today simply by saying we are one of the smaller agencies in your, uh, in your targets and also in state government. But our impact, we think, is really huge. Uh, at the bottom of your handout, you'll see the number 26.8 million. That's the number of Minnesota, uh, no, Minnesotans is wrong. That's the number of individuals who were served by programs or activities that were funded by the Arts Board of the Regional Arts Councils in the last biennium. So we stretch the dollars as far as we can and we do our very best to reach and serve all Minnesotans and all Minnesota communities. We thank you for your time and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation in coming meetings. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, well done, appreciate that. And members, again, uh, more details, more information, just contact Ms. Jones. Uh, the next uh, agenda uh, subject is going to go from maybe one of the smallest to one of the largest, uh, Minnesota Management and Budget. Uh, Commissioner Showalter is able to join us today. Welcome, Commissioner. You've had a busy morning. I saw you on Finance Committee for an hour and a half, and now we get to see you here, too. So... Uh, welcome, and just go ahead and present uh, about MMB. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, uh, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and uh, pleased to join you this morning. Um, is my volume okay? Yes, it is. Okay. 
Um, so I uh, just want to, uh, for uh, the members, uh, some of you who I know, some of you who I don't, I just want you to know this is my second opportunity to serve at MMB. Um, having been state budget director for Governor Plenty and commissioner uh, for Governor Dayton, I got a chance to be with the agency when we were starting to put it together. Uh, merging the departments of finance and the agency of employee relations, putting them together to create this new entity. And it's a treat to come back six years later and say, oh, this is what it's grown up to be. Uh, it is a place that is trying to serve all Minnesotans by working together to ensure that state government is effective and transparent, fair and innovative, and always, always trying to improve. Our mission statement is pretty simple. We're stewards of the state's financial and human resources, delivering effective services for the people of Minnesota. Just so you know, we support the more than 56,000 employees of the state workforce, that includes Minnesota State, uh, Minnesota, uh, state Universities, who deliver those services and provide resources necessary to do their jobs well. Our agency, despite the really broad uh, parameters, has 265 employees. Our general fund operating budget is about $27 million, and we're responsible for or significantly involved in carrying out more than 1,800 statutory requirements. We coordinate the budget process for 100 state agencies. Uh, we work through human resources policies and recruitment. We set the policies for talent management and training. We manage $8 billion in public debt. We pay thousands of vendors for, that supply goods and services to the public sector. We process payroll for the state workforce, administer uh, the group insurance program, produce budget forecasts, and negotiate contracts with labor unions. These are just some of the responsibilities uh, that our agency has. As you can tell, um, you know, you, it, it is not surprising that uh, Chair Kish, Kipmeyer and I are running into each other twice in the same morning. <laughs> We've got a lot of phases and a lot of activities. And uh, it, it's a challenge, but uh, we're proud of it and uh, proud of the responsibility and uh, the, the obligation to serve Minnesotans. We try to do this by using, uh, making decisions based on good data. Get, getting trusted experts and community insights. We're always trying to modernize, support, and energize a talented workforce. Ultimately, we need to think broad and deliver enterprise services in a collaborative and holistic manner and direct, model, and responsible and transparent fiscal uh, management. You know, it's sometimes we think about uh, MMB as the bean counters. It's a lot more than that because, as, as you can tell, what we're really trying to do is achieve success by helping our partners meet their mission and goals. It's not always easy, it's never pretty, but that's where we're trying to go. Uh, we have a lot of big challenges ahead. You know, one of our focuses right now is equity and inclusion. It's fundamental to the future of state government. <clears throat> you should know that the Office of the Chief Inclusion Officer works within MMB and helps support our organizational structures to incorporate this priority so that it's part of our systems, it's part of our operating procedures, and that we diversify state leadership. This is really crucial to, so that state government is representative of the people we serve. I also want to highlight that there are significant areas and contributions where MMB is sort of outside our, our lane, like helping on the COVID response. Uh, I can't underestimate, overestimate the amazing work our state workforce has done to respond to that. Um, as Commissioner Roberts Davis will uh, attest, you know, there are people doing amazing things, uh, she being one of them, to respond to the, uh, the, the emergencies. We have about 1.8 million hours that we've counted so far on COVID-related responses. And as a result, our, our, our team has been resilient and adaptive, and our MMB team has been in the center of it, analyzing, providing economic information, providing transparency, redeploying into functions um, uh, throughout on a daily basis. I just want to take one more quick note to say some of the an example of where we went a little deeper in our response work. As you know, MMB staffs and manages the Children's Cabinet. It's an interagency partnership. Uh, it makes sure that Minnesota is a place for children and families to thrive no matter what their race or zip code. Our commitment to this work continues and has been elevated in the pandemic, particularly around child care strategies to help providers stay open during this unprecedented crisis and ensure that emergency worker access is still there for childcare and knowing that one third of our healthcare workforce is dependent on childcare. The children's cabinet and our agencies, including DHS have come together to understand and get that information from providers, understand the provider type and try to support them. You know, we recognize that these providers are the heroes and continue to perform that critical work 
uh, so that they can help take care of the frontline workers and the children of those frontline workers. This work group is staffed by the MMB's Children's Cabinet and has helped providers stay open by developing supply chains, building tailored financial toolkits, creating a website for open child care providers so that families can find needed care, standing up a COVID-19 screening program, and more. I'd just like to thank Chair Kiffmeyer for her partnership and open dialogue with this work group and providing feedback and supports in reaching out to local supp uh, suppliers and providers uh, in this effort. You, know, you should also know that the COVID-19 Responsible Res Accountability Office is also within MMB. So that's where we're trying to understand, manage, and uh, track the use of uh, COVID-19 funding. Uh, I, I, we get into that. In fact, that was the subject of our uh, Senate Finance Committee uh, testimony this morning. Happy to go into that more um, if you would like. Uh, I just want to say that I'm proud of being the MM, part of the MMB team again. Uh, it is a great group. Uh, state government is a great place, and I um, certainly uh, am just am amazed by the impact our small agency has on the state. Um, we continue to take on more responsibilities. Drives me a little crazy sometimes, but we do. Um, and because ultimately we're trying to get things done and we take our responsibilities seriously and everything we do is for the betterment of Minnesotans. We've repeatedly tried and demonstrated that MAB can provide resources to agencies to help them work consistently and efficiently and avoid and reduce compliance issues and legal issues. We have professional and dedicated workforce uh, I just want to say that, you know, much of what we do oftentimes goes unnoticed. It's behind the scenes, but you should know as a committee, I appreciate this chance to sort of crow a little bit because we're behind a lot of the work that's going on. So thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview. Uh, happy to take questions, uh, and I'm sure I'll be back in the future um, as we try to work through this year's budget and all of the challenges ahead for state government. So thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, committee members. Thank you, Commissioner Showalter. We really appreciate it. Um, it's always hard when you have an agency of your size and what you do to condense that into three, four minutes. <laughs> but you did a good job. You got a lot in. And uh, again, we will be seeing you uh, again in the future and look forward to that. With um, members, we, we would love to do more questions, but with such a full agenda, if we start doing questions, we will not finish. And in fairness to everybody, who scheduled their day today, made time to come today, some are first, some are last. We want to make sure that everybody is treated uh, properly in regards to the amount of time that they are given. So with the next one we'll go to is uh, the Department of Revenue, uh, probably a department that every single one of us is uh, quite knowledgeable about in some way or another and the work that they do. And um, previous commissioner, uh, appreciate it very much, but we have, uh, I believe, uh, Commissioner Doty, you are relatively new. Maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself and then also about the Department of Revenue with this short time we have. Mr. Doty, Commissioner Doty. Your sound is not good, Commissioner. If you're breaking up. Madam Chair, can, we're getting some feedback. I'm sorry. I, Members, would everybody can, be sure that you your sound can you hear is me? off? That can be helpful. I'll turn mine off as well. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but you have to speak longer to know if you're not breaking up. Okay, if you can hear me, um, hopefully, hopefully this works. All right, well, M Madam Chair, committee, um, good morning. Um, my name is Robert Doty, and I am the, the, the newly appointed commissioner for the Department of Revenue. Um, just briefly, um, I have been on the job since uh, November 12th, and, um, and previous to uh, this appointment, I was the uh, one of the assistant commissioners um, at the Department of Revenue. So I am excited and honored and humbled to be in this role. And I am looking forward to working with, uh, with, with the legislature um, in this, uh, as we go through and put together um, this budget and, and the, the, the issues that we'll be dealing with this year. So I look forward to working with this committee. Um, a lot. So um, with that, I'd like to just provide you with a very brief um, overview of the 
of the work of the department and, um, and who we serve and, and how we do our job. So at the Minnesota Department of Revenue, our mission is working together to fund Minnesota's future. We collect and distribute tax dollars to local and state programs and help fund many of the resources provided by our state tax dollars. Our job is to help customers understand and meet their tax obligations under the Minnesota tax code through efficient and effective tax administration. Each year, we issue over $2.1 million in income tax refunds and collect nearly $27 billion in tax revenue for the state. We serve our customers with 1,400 employees across 19 unique divisions. Our employees work remotely and in offices located in St. Paul, Greater Minnesota, and key locations throughout the country. We process tax returns for nearly 3 million individual income tax filers. We serve 850,000 property tax filers and 850 licensed property tax assessors in all 87 counties across the state. Plus, more than 430,000 business income tax filers and over 345,000 businesses that collect, file, and pay sales tax each month. Because we serve a diverse group of customers, we need a variety of ways to deliver service. This ranges from advanced technical systems to in-person services over the phone and in writing. We continuously improve and update our information technology systems. We strive to secure and efficient, we, excuse me, we strive to be secure and efficient in how we operate by using the latest technology. Ensuring taxpayer information is safe and secure is one of our top priorities. Our staff, along with our partners at Minnesota IT Services, are dedicated to making sure Minnesota's tax technology systems are safe from hackers and online attacks. Minnesotans trust us with some of their most protected information, and we take that trust seriously. And we pride ourselves on the systems and procedures in place to safeguard taxpayer information. We make sure taxpayers file their return and pay their obligated taxes. Most Minnesota taxpayers comply with the state's tax laws voluntarily through education and information customers receive about their tax obligations. However, we are also responsible for protecting the state's revenue through auditing, collecting, and criminal investigation. Through these efforts, we return more than $400 million to the state each year. We also provide the legislature and administration with revenue estimates of the fiscal impact of tax proposals and forecast revenues for several taxes as part of the state budget process. Various research reports and studies, including ongoing reports and one-time studies are also produced by the department. Our appeals and legal services division interprets tax laws for the department, handles taxpayer appeals, ensures the department follows the law, and helps draft and change tax laws. Appeal staff members work to resolve disputes with taxpayers and help the attorney general's office with tax-related lawsuits. At the Department of Revenue, our vision is that everyone reports, pays, and receives the right amount, no more or no less. So Madam Chair, and committee, thank you uh, for your time. And, um, and that's, that's what I wanted just to give you a brief overview. And with that, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Thank you, Mr. Doty. Uh, we do appreciate your being here. I would suspect there might be many questions, but today is not the day for that. And members want to encourage you again, to communicate directly with Mr. Doty, anything you would like to have. Thank you, Mr. Doty for being here. With that, we'll go ahead to the Department of Administration, uh, Commissioner Robert Thank you. Davis. Good. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Mr. Doty, Commissioner, oh, there you go, okay. Sorry, Ms. Roberts Davis, Commissioner. Um, I just needed to get that background noise there for you. Are you able um, to hear me okay? Yes. 
Thank you. Good morning, uh, um, Madam Chair and members. I'm Alice Roberts Davis, Commissioner of the Department of Administration. Thank you for the invitation to provide a brief introduction to the Department of Administration or admin, uh, the work of our 540 team members and the diverse service offerings of our 25 unique business divisions. We are a central service agency, meaning that in large part, our partners and customers are other state agencies. We serve the governor's office, the legislature, local municipalities, and nonprofit organizations. And we also, to a lesser extent, provide services directly to Minnesotans. Our partners are internal to state government. Uh, they rely on us to provide the critical core services that help them operate effectively. These services include overseeing the state's annual purchasing of about $3 billion in goods and services, we manage the state's 6,200 state-owned buildings, 828 property leases, and more than 350 annual construction projects. We also manage a more than 2,000 vehicle fleet and $15.7 billion of insured state assets. The unique relationship that we have with our partners and our expertise with key enterprise services allowed admin to play a key role in the state's pandemic response. Myself, uh, Assistant Commissioner Aaron Campbell, and at least 15 other team members from the department have been redeployed to work full-time on the response efforts. That number of actual team members and the uh, team members themselves have fluctuated since March, but that's in addition to our normal workload, which has not yielded. So our entire team has really stepped up to contribute. So specifically, what is it that we do? If we were meeting today in person, uh, you would see that our facilities maintenance crews would be keeping the Minnesota Senate building, the state capitol, and the other capitol complex buildings operational and clean. Uh, they are our most visible service, but there's a lot more that we do that is not as public facing. For example, we manage, construct, and lease property for state government. Our facilities management maintains and operates 23 state-owned buildings, including the state capitol, 32 parking facilities, 25 monuments and associated grounds for a total of 4.4 million square feet. The division also coordinates events on the Capitol complex and oversees the administration of Minnesota's bookstore, the state register and central mail. Our real estate and construction services division manages over 350 construction projects and 850 property leases annually. Overall, the state has a real property footprint that includes 6,200 buildings and gross square feet in acreage equaling about 5.5% of the state and provides comprehensive leasing services to state agencies seeking state-owned and not non-state-owned real estate for lease. The Enterprise Real Property Division coordinates 19 state agencies that have responsibility for managing real property. The governance structure for that division was formed to prevent to, or pro, to provide a transparent, collaborative, and uniform methodology for assessing the condition of state facilities. We manage the state's fleet, equipment, and insurance. Fleet services leases vehicles to state agencies for official state business. The division's lease program manages vehicle acquisition and disposition, fueling, maintenance, insurance, in life cycle management for roughly 2,000 vehicles. Our surplus services team assists with the redistribution, reuse, and disposal of state and federal surplus property. The division also operates the state auction program, which sells surplus property to the public by a live and online auction. Our risk management, management division operates Minnesota State Government Insurance Program, State Workers' Compensation and Safety Program. We provide safety, loss control, risk, and insurance programs, consulting services to state agencies, and we actively work to get people back to work sooner and control costs through the MinSafe initiative. We manage the state's public contracting. The Office of State Procurement oversees $3.2 billion in goods and service procurement annually. The division negotiates volume discounts and passes along the savings to state agencies and local units of government through 1,600 enterprise contracts and the two largest multi-state cooperative purchasing programs in the nation. Their colleagues in the Office of Equity and 
procurement ensure greater equity in state contracting and construction. They provide opportunities to do business with the state and provide assistance to small businesses owned by women, minorities, people with substantial physical disabilities, and veterans as they seek state contracts. In 2020, we successfully increased state purchasing with those groups to $120 million, and we're so proud of that. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or the PTAC, provides assistance to all Minnesota businesses interested in selling their products to local, state, or federal governments, and that team helps match Minnesota businesses with government contracting opportunities. The Minnesota PTAC is nationally recognized as a top program and is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency. Um, we provide Robert, enterprise... Ms. Roberts yeah. Davis, are you coming to a close? We're a little over time here. I know okay. So many good things to talk about, but... We're... Yes, we do provide a number of... Um, enterprise services as well, which I'd love to tell you about, and some community services. One thing that I do want to touch on uh, briefly before I go for sure is the 2020 census. We're so proud to have helped make Minnesota number one in the country for self-response rate in the 2020 census, and um, uh, a number of other things that we do here. We uh, have vision, mission, and values around uh, one Minnesota, and we've adopted that in everything that we do. And I, I suppose I'll close if I'm over my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roberts Davis. You have a very, very large uh, lot of things that you are in. And so I know this is particularly challenging for you as it may be for others as well. But thank you for your time. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. We'll hear more from you another day. Thank you. All right. Uh, next one on our agenda is the Minnesota Historical Society, Mr. Kent Whitworth is with us today. Welcome and go ahead and give your presentation, Mr. Whitworth. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer. It's nice to see you, uh, members of the committee and, and colleagues. Um, my uh, Speaking of colleagues, my colleague, uh, David Kelleher, uh, Director of Public Policy at MNHS is with us. Uh, we were thinking that we might try to um, share a quick PowerPoint, but uh, I'll go ahead and get started. And if David's able to, to uh, make those arrangements, great. Um, the Minnesota Historical Society was chartered by the Territorial Legislature in, in, in 1849, uh, almost a nine full years before statehood. Um, that makes us the oldest educational institution in Minnesota. Uh, we are a major uh, nonprofit partner with the state of Minnesota, um, a public history partner, and we are committed to using the power of history to transform lives. Uh, I believe each of you will have received a PDF of our annual report uh, in addition to a copy of this PowerPoint. Why don't I just touch briefly on why history matters? Uh, frankly, history has more to do with the future than it does the past. We believe strongly that the better, under, the better we understand the past, uh, the better stewards we can be of the future. And so that's why this work matters so much, uh, that sense of legacy that we leave behind for future generations. And there are core functions of state government on the preservation and access of this historical evidence that is uh, a part of our work and, and is really at the heart of the inter intersection between Minnesota state government and the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, we operate a number of historic sites across the state. Um, and I uh, wanted to just touch briefly on the Oliver Kelly Farm in Elk River. This is a photograph of our Victory Garden from uh, the, the 2020, 2020 calendar year. I wanted to share the Victory Garden because this is a perfect example of the innovation and the creativity of my colleagues at MNHS responding to the needs of the pandemic. We were able to work with the food shelf in Elk River and plant a Victory Garden of, of produce that, that, their, um, that the clients they serve could use. And I'm proud to say that we provided more than 9,000 pounds of fresh produce to the Elk River food shelf uh, through the garden that was planted at one of our historic sites, the Oliver Kelly Farm. Just one of many examples of how we've tried to respond to the pandemic. I'll move on and say just a word or two about our strategic priorities. In the next slide or two, um, you will see those priorities which have guided our work for the last several years. 
We're in the midst of a strategic planning process right now and are engaging with a number of legislators, probably several of you on this committee and others, and you will be helping provide valuable feedback as we chart our course in the future with a new strategic plan. We provide a lot of uh, a wide variety of educational programs and services, our historic sites, uh, programming through K-12, our library and collections, and also exhibits programs, as well as technical assistance and outreach and grants to uh, uh, historical organizations across the state. Very proud of the work that we've done with uh, our Northern Lights textbook. Um, this is the sixth grade textbook that is used by 90% of the sixth graders across Minnesota. The pins on the map represent the school system that have adopted our textbook. But once again, I wanna to touch on uh, one of the pivots that we made in response to the pandemic. Uh, we immediately, as the feedback we received from parents and teachers was uh, most affirming. So we're grateful to have that online, online resource available to support virtual learning across Minnesota. As I conclude, I'll just say a word about our, our historic sites network. You see on the map um, that we have historic sites across the state from Split Rock Lighthouse up in the Northeast to um, Jeffers Petroglyphs in the southeast part of the state and, and everything um, in between. It, it, it uh, comprises more than 140 historic structures. Also wanna say a quick word about the vast holdings at the Minnesota History Center. We are the keepers of Minnesota's material culture and its state archives. You see those numbers that help you understand the vastness of the collections but that photograph may say it all, where there's a forklift operator using uh, uh, the forklift to uh, access one of those uh, boxes in our state archives. So just wanted to speak to the scale of the collections that we steward on behalf of the people of Minnesota. And as I conclude, I'll just say a word or two about the number of people we serve. In a typical year, obviously 2020 was anything but typical, but we um, in a regular year would serve a million people plus in person through our historic sites and museums. 200,000 of them are school children and we reached uh, uh, many people virtually. You see 5 million visits annually to our, our uh, website and our online tools. One other way to look at the people we serve is to look at a deeper level of engagement in this next slide. And that refers to the, um, the 15,000 plus members that uh, support our work, um, the 27,000 National History Day students, middle school through high school, that are in, engaged in historical research and presentation through MNHS throughout the year. So this is not a one-off field trip. This is a, an in-depth engagement. Um, and we distinguish ourselves at the national uh, level each year through National History Day. And I'll conclude with just a word about our volunteers. Frankly, we could not deliver the comprehensive programming and services we provide without the strong core of 2,500 plus volunteers and interns contributing, you see, in, uh, in excess of 70,000 hours uh, a year. So that's just a quick snapshot of all that MNHS is about day in and day out on behalf of the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer, members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Whitworth. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll go to the Office of the Reviser uh, next to uh, Mr. Inman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, for the record, my name is Ryan Inman, and I'm the Reviser of Statutes here at the Minnesota Legislature in the Office of the Reviser of Statutes. Um, thanks, as always, for the opportunity to speak a little bit about the various tasks that we do on your behalf every single day here. Um, as you're probably aware, we are a joint nonpartisan staff office of the Minnesota Legislature. Most, if not all, of our duties are codified under Minnesota Statutes uh, Chapter 3C. We've got about 60-ish um, permanent and session employees that are doing the work of the legislature, both throughout the legislative session and during the interim as well. Um, our primary responsibility or function is to provide legislative and legal services to the House 
Senate and other state government entities as directed by law. Um, we break our services up really into four primary buckets. There's the legislative drafting services, there are the legal publication duties, information technology services, and then sort of the catch-all other services or, or miscellany. I'll touch on each of them briefly. Um, as far as legislative services are concerned, uh, we draft bills, amendments, resolutions. That's probably the most obvious interface that we have with members during session, particularly this time of session. Um, just as sort of a footnote to that, right now we've got about 1,800 active requests for the 2021 session. That's bills and resolutions. The vast majority of those were received after the seventh special session last December. So um, almost 2,000 requests since December 15th, which is a, a volume that is nearly unprecedented. Um, later in session, you'll see us doing work on committee reports and engrossments as you transition to your committee work. Um, and then at the very end of session, we put together side-by-sides, desk compar comparison reports, conference committee reports, and those sorts of documents that the legislature relies on to complete its work at the end of session. Um, one of our most critical functions of the legislature is to provide quality control, um, ensuring that the documents that you see, the bills that you see, have been thoroughly vetted from both a technical and a legal perspective, which is why every single bill that's introduced in the legislature crosses the desks of my editorial staff and one of my lawyers before it can be introduced. As far as our legal publishing duties are concerned, we are the official publisher of laws of Minnesota, Minnesota statutes and Minnesota rules. So we compile, edit and publish those all on a routine basis. I'm gonna do a little bit of show and tell here. Um, annually, we publish laws of Minnesota. These are the gold books that you'll see lying around the Capitol. What those contain are all of the enactments from the previous year. So the book that I just held with, contains everything that the legislature did during the 2020 regular session and the first through third special sessions. Uh, we also publish Minnesota statutes. This is published in full every other year, and that contains all material, uh, legal material that is of general and permanent nature. So think uh, traffic regulations, uh, items involving the organization of state go government, those sorts of things. So that's published in, in even numbered years. This is the 18 version that you just saw. The 20 version will be out um, and delivered in the next couple of weeks. You'll see it. it's actually going to be blue this year. Um, we also publish Minnesota rules. This is done in odd numbered years. It's currently green, um, but that is a compilation of all of the administrative rules that are adopted by our state agencies um, pursuant to legislative authority granted by you. Um, we publish all of those both in print and, ele and electronically, and both the electronic and print versions are authorized and designated as official for use in all courts and proceedings. Uh, we also provide a wide range of IT services to the legislature. That includes networking, storage, processing, and data. Um, we're responsible for the VoIP tel uh, telephone system that you use every day. Um, we have developed in-house the drafting, legislative drafting system that we use to draft bills, amendments, resolutions. And I'd assist the, the Senate desk do their journal production, those sorts of things. Um, we also maintain a permanent database containing all of Minnesota law. And we also support the legislature's website functionality um, for the legal material and uh, for the bill tracking system as well. We've also got a, a range of other services we provide, um, probably the most important being that we, in, we are the enrollment officer for the state legislature. And so what that means is that when this House and Senate pass a bill in identical form and it's ready to be presented to the governor, we put it on archival quality paper, get the signatures from the relevant officers and present that to the governor for his signature or veto. Uh, we also provide legal counsel to the legislature concerning the effect of existing laws, proposed legislation and those sorts of things. We assist the executive branch with administrative rule drafting. So when you authorize them to adopt rules, we assist them with the drafting of those rules. Um, we produce a court opinions report every other year, which contains uh, information regarding uh, court of opinion, court opinions from the, U or the Minnesota Court of Appeals and the Minnesota Supreme Court, where they identify a deficiency in one of our statutes. So I uh, think ambiguity, vagueness, those sorts of things. So we compile all those and provide that as a report to the legislature so you can act or not act as you see fit. Uh, we do an annual revisor's bill where we make technical corrections to existing statutes where we remove obsolete language, fix cross-references, those sorts of things. It's a purely technical bill. Um, and then we also develop and um, routinely edit and publish a drafting manual. So it establishes all of the standards that we use for the bills that you see in uh, in committee. So that, that's the, really the, the 30,000 foot overview. As brief as I can be, I'm always happy to take questions. 
um, uh, or you can reach out to me directly after the hearing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Inman. Um, every time I hear that list of what your office does, it always just amazes me. And also you're um, uh, doing your own software um, as well. I think that's testament to all the good work you guys do. So thank you. Our next item on the agenda is going to be the next entity will be the Office of Administrative Hearings. We're very glad today to have Chief Judge Starr with us. And so welcome, Judge Starr. Please just go ahead and present, introduce yourself. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I am Jenny Starr, Chief Judge at the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I am so pleased to be with you here today. The Office of Administrative Hearings, or OAH, was created by the legislature in 1975. We are the largest of three courts located in the executive branch of government. We have 60 full-time equivalents, approximately half of whom are employed in the role of judge. Our offices are in Duluth and St. Paul. We serve the entire state of Minnesota, and but for the pandemic, we regularly travel across the state to provide impartial administrative hearings and high quality dispute resolution services at locations convenient to the parties in our cases. Now our jurisdiction can generally uh, be explained across four groupings of cases. If you have our handout, um, you'll see four boxes on the first page. I'll start with workers' compensation. We hear all litigated claims in workers' compensation. That's approximately 10,000 disputes filed each year involving approximately 7,500 workers and their employers, insurers, and medical providers. Our purpose here is to provide a fair hearing, one that favors neither employees nor employers, and to do so in a quick and efficient manner. Our workers' compensation cases make up almost 80% of our court's work. The other 20% of our work is spread across over 200 areas of administrative law, and this is represented by the three remaining boxes on the first page of our handout. Our purpose here is to increase public accountability in government by providing a fair, accessible, and uniform hearing process. So an example might be a case where a parent kind of contests a decision made by a school in their child's individual education program, or IEP. A professional or business license holder might contest the suspension or revocation of their license. Other cases include utility rates and routes, certain data privacy matters, environmental permits, and more. The commonality here is that these cases involve challenges to state and local government action. In rulemaking, OAH uh, reviews rules proposed by state agencies to determine whether they are necessary, reasonable, and comply with state law. And we oversee the process to make sure that the public has a meaningful opportunity to be heard prior to a rule being promulgated. We also preside over boundary adjustment requests. Now our strength, I think, is threefold, at least threefold. It starts with the caliber and professionalism of our judges. It's supported by our administrative staff and their dedication to detail. And it includes the wide range of services we offer. In addition to trial level hearings, we offer all forms of alternative dispute resolution, presiding over settlement conferences, mediations, and arbitration. Across all of this work, we, of course, respect the tenets of procedural fairness, ensuring the opportunity for each person to express their own viewpoint, treating everyone with courtesy and respect, making unbiased and fair decisions. And we're also an energetic, nimble uh, delivery of service, and we're open to feedback. In fact, today, we are carefully reviewing feedback received last week and solicited by us last week from attorneys um, about a new process that is intended to support injured workers in receiving timely payments on their claims after reaching a negotiated settlement with their employer. We're making specific timely changes based on the feedback we received, and we appreciate the bar's deep commitment to partnership with us in our continuous improvement efforts. You'll see more about our commitment to stakeholder engagement and continuous improvement on the second page of our handout. In wrapping up, I'd just like to say that I plan to reach out to each of your LAs and seek a few more minutes of your time. I'd love to tell you more about what we've done to improve the virtual hearing experience and kept our operations open and available to the public without disruption during this pandemic. 
I'd love to answer your questions. And of course, I'd love to introduce myself and share my qualifications with each of you and get to know more of you uh, better. Senator Coran, for example, maybe we could chat about the Northwest Saddle Club and North Branch. My grandparents and mother were longtime members. Senator Claussen, I started my professional career providing free legal services to low-income families in Dakota County at Legal Assistance of Dakota County. These are just a few ways in which I'd love to reach out to you personally and get to know you. Thank you so much for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Starr. Appreciate your presentation and the depth and breadth of the work that you do. Thank you. With that, we'll move on. We're going to have to be really um, tight as we go forward here because we want to complete uh, our full agenda here. Our next one is the Minnesota Humanities Center. Mr. Lindsay, welcome, Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer and, and fellow senators of this committee. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Again, my name is Kevin Lindsay and I'm the CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center. Our vision is a, a just society that is curious, connected and compassionate. Curious in that we come to conversations with open hearts and open minds to hear one another. Connected that we see ourselves intertwined uh, and see the value of other lives. And compassionate that we're moved beyond empathy toward action and achieving a just society. And we use the disciplines of the humanities to facilitate this um, curious, connected, and compassionate society. On August 1st, we will turn 50 years old. And that was the year in which the Minnesota legislature first gave dollars to the Minnesota Humanities to facilitate gifting of humanities instructions and programs in the state of Minnesota. Since that point in time, we have secured a building which is located on the east side of St. Paul. It's in the last building, uh, formerly of the Gillette Children's Hospital Complex. And in the one pager, you'll see that on a non-COVID year, we have a little bit more than 11,000 visitors that come through, nonprofit organizations, governmental entities, individuals use the facility um, on a regular basis, and we host humanities events there. Uh, we appreciate the dollars made available from the legislature last year for bonding assistance, uh, and we look forward to continuing to deliver programming to have that as an event center for folks uh, all throughout Minnesota. Um, we also issue grants. Um, so we par partner and facilitate grants from dollars that have been provided by the Minnesota legislature. Most recently, the cultural heritage grants uh, were grants that we provided throughout the entire state of Minnesota. And we're intentional in our outreach efforts to make sure that all have an opportunity to participate and apply for any grants which have been made available by the state. We also leverage the relationship that we have with the National Endowment for the Humanities. So the Minnesota Humanities is one of 56 humanities organizations that have an affiliation with the National Endowment for the Humanities. So one in every state, and then one in the six territories that comprise uh, the United States. This is a special relationship. It is one that brings in opportunities for academic scholarship and learning. Uh, Minnesota can be right to be proud. The highest honor uh, issued by the National Endowment for the Humanities is a gentleman by the name of Father Columbus Stewart at St. John's University. Uh, we partnered with the uh, History Center to celebrate Father Columbus Stewart, and we're continuing to elevate some of his work with scholars, specifically on cultural heritage and religion all throughout the world uh, through his visits this upcoming year. Uh, I'll briefly say something about programs just to wet your whistle because I want to follow up with each individual members. I appreciate it. I'm coming up on three minutes here. So we do projects like we did yesterday with Malice Toward None in which we had uh, Mitch Perlstein from the Center of American Experiment, Pei Kao Hung from uh, a variety of different uh, perspectives, uh, someone who would identify as red and someone who identifies blue to help facilitate constructive dialogue and how we can engage more effectively uh, on, from a civic renewal basis. We've also published books such as the Somali Anthology, Native American Young Readers Series, uh, which uh, is uh, well, very widely recepted and is winning various awards. We also partner with school districts with our Educators Institute, and there are schools that, uh, again, that we partner with other entities around the state to listen to educators and to hear what they want within their schools and we seek to provide scholars to assist them in the creation of it. We Are Water, Why Treaties Matter, Statewide Exhibits, Museum on Main Street, which we partner with the Smithsonian Institute, uh, again to hear for what people want within their respective communities. 
I look forward to the opportunity for the one-on-one -on -one conversations with the committee members. Appreciate the opportunity the senators have made today, and thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer, for the opportunity to present very briefly on the things that we do at the Minnesota Humanities. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. I appreciate your presence today and sharing of the work that you do at the Minnesota Humanities Center. Uh, with that, we'll move to the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board. Mr. Paul Mandel is on deck. Mr. Mandel, if you'd go ahead and... Thank you, Madam Chair um, and members. Uh, Paul Mandel, Executive Secretary for the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board. Again, another very small board. You know you're small when your title of the agency is bigger than your staff is deep. We have four staff members, two full-time and two part-time. Um, we were established, the cap board was established by the legislature to report directly to the legislature back in 1967. Um, you have, I believe, our biennial report recently published and it shows um, a, a aerial photo we are a 60 block, we are responsible for zoning and design in a 60 block area surrounding the state capitol, reaching into downtown St. Paul. Our statute is 15B. The board's mission is fourfold. To First of all, and most predominant, is to preserve, protect, and enhance the beauty, dignity, and architectural integrity of the capitol building, the capitol area, and the surrounding buildings. Um, to also protect and enhance the open space around the building, and uh, the approaches to the Capitol building. And lastly, to establish and maintain a comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance for the Capitol area. The Cap Board consists of 12 members, four appointed by the governor, with chaired by the Lieutenant Governor, uh, four members of the legislature, and three members appointed by the mayor of St. Paul, one of whom must reside within our district. As I said, the staff serving that board is four members, uh, two part-time and two full-time. We have exclusive zoning jurisdiction. We supersede the city on zoning in the capital area and design review over both state government complex and private areas, residential included. The agency guides the planning and design with the comprehensive plan and the zoning, and the zoning ordinance. We are currently in the final throes of a three-year in-house rewrite of the comprehensive plan for the entire area. These two documents serve to guide development in and around the capital area. And we have formed the new comprehensive plan around seven guiding principles. In, um, in 2011, we, along with the Historical Society and the, and the Department of Administration, were responsible for the restoration of the capital building. Uh, we also are responsible for memorials on the capital grounds and art and uh, sharing with the Historical Society art in the Capitol building, as well as historic and ceremonial spaces. Our operating budget is only $351,000. And over the past 53 years of our existence, the Cap Board has had provided leadership in guiding the design of seven, the seven new bridges in the, uh, on the interstate freeway in the Capitol area at I-94 and I-34 at five, the History Center, Judicial Center, seven other new state buildings, 12 memorials, routing and design of the light rail transit, and countless public and private improvements. We're currently also uh, working with the two new task forces on art and memorials in the Capitol building and the Capitol grounds and working with the Historical Society and administration on that. With that, Madam Chair, I'll yield the rest of my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mandel, uh, much appreciated. And so uh, that touch, I know there are many questions and members, again, you can follow up with Mr. Mandel. With that, we will now go to the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Uh, Ms. Geshek, um, glad to have you with us today. Uh, you're not on video. Do you have video available? We'd love to see you. Madam Chair, I'm hitting the video button. It's showing that I have video, but I see my screen as as black. Oh, oh there we go. Are. It just popped on. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Shannon Gijek. I'm an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa Northern Minnesota. I was appointed as the Executive Director of the Indian Affairs Council in September of 2019. Previously, I served as a legislative and grants coordinator for MIAC, and prior to that, I worked for MINDOT. 
Uh, this is my first first time testifying as the ED to this committee, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you here today. The mission of the Indian Affairs Council is to protect this, the sovereignty of, of the tribal nations that share geography with the state and to ensure the well-being of American Indian citizens throughout. Established in 1963 under both state and tribal leadership, the Indian Affairs Council is the oldest council of its kind in the nation and serves as a liaison between the tribal governments and the state of Minnesota. The council advises and makes recommendations to state policy makers, um, such as the governor's office and the legislature. We also alert our board to any legislation with potential impacts tribes. The MIAC proposes the agenda for the annual governor tribal leader summit we also fulfill duties found in Minnesota Statutes 307.08, the Private Cemeteries Act, through our cultural resource program who works closely with the Office of State Archaeologist and partners with uh, tribal historic preservation officers to protect American Indian grave sites and burial mounds. They oversee the osteology lab housed at Hamlin University, the only osteology lab of its kind in the state. Furthermore, we administer the Dakota and Ojibwe Language Preservation and Revitalization Grant Program. We are a re-grantor through the Arts and Cultural Heritage Legacy Amendment Funds. MIAC owns and loans a copy of the White Treaties Matter Traveling Exhibit created in partnership with the Minnesota Humanities Center and the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. We also present a MIAC 101 training at the tri Tribal State Relations Training as well as to state agency groups to educate on our scope of work and resources that we provide to state agencies, employees, and the public. A, a significant amount of time is dedicated to aiding with requests for information or resources from across the state enterprise, as well as the general public. If we are unable to assist, we are a connector to entities that can. Our authority lies within Minnesota Statute 3.922, our executive board consists of the elected tribal leaders um, who possess voting rights. MIAC membership also includes a non-voting board consisting of a member of the governor's official staff, two members of the Senate, two members of the House, and 12 state agency commissioners. Although not official members of our board, the remaining state agency commissioners do participate in our quarterly board meetings. Um, in our quarterly board meetings, uh, and they present a, a wide variety of topics of interest um, that their agencies have identified generally through their respective tribal liaisons to the MIAC executive board. Our meetings have presented effective opportunity for dialogue, information sharing, and relationship building between the state agency leadership and tribal leadership. They have helped foster understanding and identification of shared goals. In order to better serve the tribal folks outside the tribal lands, MIAC formed the Urban Indian Advisory Board, made up of two Minneapolis delegates, two St. Paul delegates, and one each for Duluth and Bemidji. The UIAB provides a forum for the urban Indian communities to raise issues, discuss potential solutions, and request action regarding the issues. They report to the MIAC board. I think it's worth a mention that the Ombudsperson for American Indian Families also reports uh, to the board during our quarterly meetings. MIAC prepares an annual report to the legislature. We are wrapping up this report now and it should be available for you in the next week or so here. MIAC maintains offices in Bemidji and in St. Paul. And at this time, Madam Chair, I'd like to talk about some of the accomplishments that we had this year, but I wanna be mindful and respectful of time and I have a, a minute or two to talk about some of the great work we've done the past year. Um, okay. okay. You just have a very short period of time here to conclude. Okay, thank you. Um, our cultural resource staff worked with the OSA Minute and MnDOT to create a MIAC spatial layer to the OSA portal that includes cultural site locations of special concern to MIAC. The layer is intended to encourage earlier and more effective consultation with MIAC uh, and the tribes. This will aid with protection of archeological and burial sites and reduce the amount of burial recoveries. The MIAC layer rolled out in July of 2020. Um, we've also switched our board meetings to a virtual um, online, a virtual online forum, which has really increased participation. We've had upwards of 200 people um, 
come to our, our quarterly board meetings. Um, and with that, um, I, I will conclude my presentation. I want to say miigwech, pidamia, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Gizek. We appreciate your being here and your time uh, of being here. Uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, next, we'll go to the Council of Minnesotans of African Heritage, uh, Ms. Linda Sloan. Good morning. I am so excited to be here. I am the newly appointed, uh, three months actually, as of yesterday, Executive Director for the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. The Minnesota Legislature empowered the Council uh, back actually 40 years ago this past year, and we're here to ensure that the people of African heritage can fully and effectively participate and receive equitable benefits from the political, social, and economic resources uh, within the state. Uh, our main charge is one, to advise the governor and the legislature on issues that are affecting the African heritage people. Two, we are also here to advise on the statutes, rules, and revisions to any programs just to ensure that the African heritage people are getting the maximum benefits and services. Uh, we serve as a liaison to the federal government, local governments, and private organizations. We implement programs, and we also publish the accomplishments of the African uh, heritage uh, community and their contributions to the state. So the net of it is, we understand what the issues are in the African heritage community. We bring those back. We find out who the partners are that can help solve the problems. And a lot of those partners are state agencies and some are community partners. And then we advise the legislature and the governor on what, what, we, what can be done and we advise them on bills. So that's the net of it. Very small staff, uh, four people. Actually, we've been operating with um, three individuals. I just got a yes on a legislative and policy director actually yesterday. So I'm excited about that. So you'll be hearing from Theodore Rose and our outreach coordinator, Amber Jones, uh, shortly, because we want to understand what, uh, what your agenda is so that we can see how we can partner. The landscape of the African heritage community. Who is the African heritage community? We're approximately 454,000 strong. We're the second largest population group in the state. Uh, and we comprise, we're 8% of the Minnesota's total population. Uh, most of the African heritage group um, would fall either under pretty much African-American or African immigrants. 36% would fall under African Americans, and then the rest would be African immigrants. The largest African immigrant population, based on the data from the state demographer, is Somalian, and that's at 14%, and then it trickles down. And so there are a, a variety of countries represented within the African Heritage Group. Um, the African American group and the African, and the I'm sorry, the African immigrant group. We have similar needs. However, in some cases, there are different issues. For example, the immigrant community, they have a lot of English language learners. And so issues that relate to those types of things would be important for us to identify and address specifically. And so based on that, we'll be spending a significant amount of time learning those needs of the African immigrant community and putting some focus on making sure that um, the rules and the statutes and bills that are put forward can positively affect them, uh, can positively affect them. So uh, basically our strategic focus for this year outside of focus on the African immigrant community, public safety and policing. George Floyd, the Capitol, I mean, there's, there's, um, everyone knows that there is some inequities in policing. And so we will be dealing with that and seeing how, how we can move the needle. Uh, healthcare inequities. Uh, the pandemic brought out, uh, which was already obvious to the African heritage community, that there is disparity in healthcare and the African heritage people have been, unfortunately been heavily impacted. We're focusing on strong families. I was happy to hear Commissioner Showalter's um, uh, presentation because it had some of that in it. Education, their education disparities, as well as economic development. So we will be focusing on a broad variety of areas because the African heritage community has been heavily um, impacted and heavily um, disadvantaged uh, 
for a long period of time, since the beginning of time, let's, uh, let's be quite frank. So I'm going to wrap up there. I have an annual report that we are just finishing and I can have that forwarded, which we'll talk to you, which will speak about the work that's being done, specific bills we've supported, things we've testified on, the outreach, all of those things. Um, I plan to be in touch as well as the legislative policy director and the outreach because we do want to know what are you thinking about? What bills are you trying to move forward and how can we ensure that we work together to make sure that the bills and policies and everything serve everyone? That's all I have for today. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, committee. It's an honor to be here and to be able to um, partner with you in the great work that the state is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Sloan. We appreciate your time and uh, the sharing of the important uh, issues that you see there. Uh, with that, we'll go to the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs and Rosa Talk is a presenter today. Welcome, Ms. Talk. Thank you, you very much. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rosa Talk. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present this morning. Um, I have been in this agency for four years, and uh, I have been serving in this position as Executive Director for a little bit over a year now. I've worked with you, Madam Chair, and uh, many of uh, the other members uh, in the last three years, and maybe less so last year because of the pandemic. But uh, I look forward, like uh, my colleagues here, uh, to working with you during this session and the upcoming sessions. Like um, the Minnesota Council on, Min uh, sorry, like the Council of Minnesotans of Africa Heritage and the Council of Nation Pacific Minnesotans, we are under the same Minnesota statute, uh, statute 15.0145. And um, our council is also tasked to advise you, uh, members of the legislature, uh, the office of the governor, and policymakers on issues of importance to our respective Latino constituents. We are a trusted bridge between Latino communities and state government. And per statute, uh, the purpose of the council is to work towards the implementation of the economic, social, legal, and political equality of Latinos in the state. Every legislator represents Latinos, so know that we are here for you and your constituents of Latino heritage. Please count on our council as a nonpartisan source of accurate information about Latino communities in your uh, districts. As an agency, we add value to state government through our singular expertise in the quality and objective analysis we deliver and direct connections with the community. I believe you have received um, uh, a link to our 2020 annual report where you will read some of our work and achievements from last year. Uh, you might have received the link. If not, you will be receiving it very soon by intra-mail office. Uh, we are also a small agency with four uh, very dedicated staff, all bilingual and bicultural. Um, we serve more than 300,000 Latino Minnesotans across the states. We represent approximately 6% uh, of the total Minnesota population. Uh, we are a very diverse community, uh, very much like uh, what uh, Ms. Lauren was uh, indicating in terms of our Latino heritages, but uh, we have been in Minnesota for many generations. 65% of Latinos have been born in the U.S. and many of them in Minnesota. But uh, despite the long uh, presence and contributions to the vitality of the state, as many studies show, particularly after the pandemic, Latinos still face some of the worst disparities in many areas including in education, access to healthcare, employment, housing, and other areas that are very important factors for stability, wealth creation, and prosperity for our families. So to tackle and address some of these issues, our staff 
comprised of three legislative directors work on three uh, on these three interconnected policy areas, education, health, and economic development. And in order to prioritize and draft our legislative and policy recommendations, we engage directly with communities, particularly in greater Minnesota, to bridge that gap between the metro area and the rural areas. Last year, we visited virtually and in person six different locations in greater Minnesota, in, in order to have a clear understanding of the issues faced by the community, which have been um, disproportionately affected by the virus. We learn the assets that are in our communities. We learn how resilient communities are. But most of all, we also learn, and that's something that uh, all studies show, is how crucial bilingual information and accessing affordable care are during a public health crisis of this magnitude. So at this time, I won't go into details about the findings and the priorities since you received links to both of our documents. Uh, uh, but, uh, and, and again, you will receive them on your mail as well. And I look forward to having a, a personal conversation with you. But needless to say, uh, we are here uh, to support and uh, help improving the socioeconomic conditions and eliminating disparities in the state because they can only yield to positive benefits for all Minnesotans. So thank you very much, Madam Chair for, and members for your time. I look forward to working with you and responding to your questions as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Talk. Appreciate your presentation, um, lots of good information. Uh, next, we'll go to the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Mr. Andrew Morris is on deck. So, Mr. Morris, if you want to go ahead and present. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to you and all the members of the committee. Can you hear me all right? can hear you very well. Great. Thank you. Uh, members, my name is Andy Morris, and I serve as the Public Affairs and Legislative Liaison for the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity pr to present to all of you and give a brief overview of our council, of who we are and what we do. I'm also joined today by the council's 2021 board chair, Mr. David Maeda. And before I begin my presentation proper, I'd like to give Mr. Maeda the opportunity to offer a few brief words of introduction of his own. David? Just so we keep it within the time. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Welcome, Mr. Maeda. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be very quick. As Andy mentioned, I'm the 2021 board chair. I just wanted to do a public thank you to Senator Pratt, who's also on our board. And Senator Pratt not only was on our board as a board member, but in 2020 served on our executive committee, which is the committee that meets monthly. Our board meets every other month. But I absolutely admire Senator Pratt's insight and advice and all the work he did on the council in 2020. I just wanted to thank him publicly for that. And with that, I'll turn it back to Andy for our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Maida. That, that was very welcome, very kind of you. Thank you to uh, Senator Coran and Senator Pratt in particular. All right, okay, thank back you. to you, Mr. Morris. Yes, uh, members, the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans is a nonpartisan, non-cabinet agency of the executive branch of the state government of Minnesota. The council was established in 1985 by the Minnesota legislature to bridge the gap that exists between Minnesotans of Asian and Pacific Islander heritage and their state government. Like the other ethnic councils, the council's enabling statute is Minnesota Statute 15.0145. This statute tasks the council with the following statutory duties. To advise the governor and the legislature on issues confronting the constituency of the council, to advocate for administrative and legislative changes needed to improve the economic and social condition of the constituency of the council, and to serve as a liaison between state government and organizations that serve the constituency of the council. The statute also provides for the establishment of a council board, which consists of 11 voting community members appointed by the governor and of four legislative voting members appointed by legislative leadership. The work of the council is operationalized by staff, including myself and my colleagues. We like to say that our council is small but mighty, with four of a maximum capacity of five staff positions currently filled. Our team consists of our executive director, Sia Her, office manager, Virakchi Thing, 
Research Director Angela Cameron and myself as Public Affairs and Legislative Liaison. At full capacity, we would also employ a research assistant, but this position is currently vacant. Asian and Pacific Islander Minnesotans, estimated at more than 300,000, can be found in every county of our state, but the diversity and circumstances of backgrounds of how they arrived vary. Whether they came as immigrants or refugees, have been in Minnesota for generations or recent arrivals, or enjoy a high degree of educational attainment and financial security, or are struggling just to get by, Asian Pacific Minnesotans form a community of contrasts. While there are many groups that can provide, comprise Asian Pacific Minnesotans, the five largest groups by population, according to this US Census Bureau, are Hmong, Asian Indian, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean. Other smaller communities, of which you may not be as aware, include the Karen, Karani, Micronesians, and Lao. In order to carry out our duties, the Council conducts a wide range of activities. We conduct original research, such as our Emerging Communities Report. We educate and encourage our community members to engage with their legislat legislators in our state's policymaking process with signature events, such as our Day at the Hill, or legislation out of our office, such as that on gender-based violence. We advise and encourage legislators and members of the executive branch to engage with Asian Pacific Minnesotans by identifying, inviting, and staffing government leaders at key events in our various communities. These are just a few examples of the work that we do at the council as we carry out our statutory duties. And as you conduct your work as legislators, know that the council is your resource for understanding Asian Pacific Minnesotans and that we are always available to help you engage with your Asian Pacific Minnesotan constituents. Uh, this has been just a very brief overview of our council, who we are, who our communities are, and what we do. I hope that you all consider the council as a resource and speaking as the council's primary legislative staff, I look forward to working together with you and the entirety of the state legislature during the 2021 session. Thank you and I welcome many questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Morris, for a good overview, and thank you, Mr. Maeda, for being here today. I appreciate that. Um, we have our final um, board to cover, go over here uh, on our agenda, and that is the Minnesota Board of Cosmetology. Uh, Ms. Gina Fast, do you want to go ahead and start your presentation? You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep, that came through now. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. wrong microphone was selected. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so good morning, almost afternoon, Chair Kiffmeyer and members of the committee. As stated, I'm Gina Fast. I'm the Executive Director for the Board of Cosmetology and thank you for the opportunity today. The board exists to promote public protection through the regulation of cosmetology practitioners, establishments, and schools. The board has just over 33,600 practitioners, 5,330 salons, and 37 schools throughout the state. The board issues 21 types of licenses. The board has been in existence in some form since 1972, and it's comprised of seven members, six hold various cosmetology-related licenses, and one is a public member. In the last biennium, the board hosted 13 uh, public full board meetings along with 21 board committee meetings. The board by statute is designated as a non-health board but collaborate daily with 17 other boards that, in, that include both health, such as nursing, medical, dental, et cetera, as well as non-health boards. Our board operations are, some, are supported by the small agency resource known as SMART in the Department of Administration. The licensing team in our board is responsible for verifying credentials and ensuring each applicant has met prerequisite training, competence, insurance, and continuing education requirements. In fiscal year 2020, the board verified and issued over 14,000 total licenses through initial applications and renewals. 
Next, our inspection team is responsible to go out and inspect licensed salons and schools to ensure establishments are demonstrating proper infection control standards as well as ensuring licensure requirements. In fiscal year 2020, we inspected over 4,000 establishments and all the schools. We were, however, unable to inspect salons in the three months while salons were closed due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've also had staff in our inspections department redeployed and one continues to be redeployed uh, to assist in the COVID pandemic response. Next, our compliance team is responsible for investigating public filed complaints on salons, schools and practitioners and for generating complaints when violations of Minnesota statutes and rules are found upon inspection or during licensure review application. In, 20, in fiscal year 2020, this team completed over nearly 250 investigations with 94 remaining open at the year close. The board offers support to all cosmetology schools as well as course providers. Our staff work closely with school owners, instructors, managers, staff, as well as the Department of Education to identify and rectify any sort of educational issues under the board's jurisdictions. I had more to say, but I kept cutting as the time kept going. So that's the conclusion of my testimony for today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Fast. I, I think that's always a challenge uh, <laughs> uh, to be in this situation for you. Um, but I suspect we will be having you before the committee as all of these will be. And then hopefully you can maybe go more detail and also the individual meetings as well. There are many questions that I know all of us had as we went through these presentations, but everybody has deferred. And as you can see, we have completely used up the time of our committee hearing today. And there are other meetings starting uh, at noon today where several of us have to be at. So we are uh, not able to go over our time. With that members, I thank everybody for your participation today, for your presentations, for your thoughtfulness, um, for the willingness to continue the conversation, whatever way it may be. And I know that in these next months, there's going to be uh, probably the character quality of patience and flexibility is going to be strained to the max. But we know that we will all do our best and we look forward to working together for the good of Minnesotans. Thank you very much. And we are adjourned.